The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I'm going to go through a number of cases with you today, so we'll have to rely on sometimes on this handout, sometimes on the slides. Let me first tell you what the handout is, contains. The first is an example from Philippe Boudon's book, Lively in Architecture. This is the housing for steel workers at Pesac near Bordeaux, which Boudon studied after a large now after a period of time, and made these drawings of the changes that people had made to the original plan, which is the top <coughs> left. The elevations indicate a couple of things, because I'm not going to go into any detail about this example. Um, people enclosed the, the open porch of Corbusier's to make garages. They replaced long linear windows by rectangular windows of a much more uh, oblong nature arguing that Corbusier's windows were not modern enough, and so on and so on. When Corbusier was asked by Boudon about these changes, he said, as epigrammatically as possible, life is more important than art. But there was, no const there was no indication that he expected or made provisions for changes to take place. He was central to modernism, that time was captured within the space of the project. He neither looked forward to changes that could be made, nor did you look back to the possibility of history or memory affecting your work. So modernism, as I try, try to indicate on Tuesday, was a kind of notion of a fixed culture which operated with the pro in the production of objects which had no reference backwards of any value. Corbusier is a classic example of a man who denies the 19th century street um, forever and then proceeds to make projects like this one in which the steel workers themselves find the capacity to change without the change being premeditated. We're going to be looking today at the issue of looking forward and what, predictable, what unpredictability means. I will make, I will use the case of MIT on the second and third page. You will see the plan of MIT from 1940, from 1920, 1916 to 1994, 2004. I'll discuss Maria Zervarado's Ezemarki's thesis and what she found. Next two pages are from Rodrigo Perez de Arque's work, arguing that Systematic adding on to existing buildings is an opportunity for good change. 
It's not at the top. Isn't it? Rodrigo Perez de Arque, A-R-C-E. He's from, he's from Colombia. Do you know him? Not <laughs> <coughs> He's a quiet man who um, uh, draws very beautiful drawings. This urban tr the, 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 in the larger reading list for this class, you'll find the reference. It's, uh, it's published in Architectural Design and also in a little handbook by the Architectural Association in London. I will show some examples of his work. Um, the next two pages are drawings by Louis Kahn and Allison and Peter Smithson of the Team 10 group, dealing with flows. The next few pages are plans of European universities from 1961 onwards, all the way through to, <coughs> to the Free University of Berlin in 1963 all slowly dealing with the architecture of change. Okay. The reaction after the end of CIM was in the hands of a small group of architects called Team 10 who put forward the possibility that time could be escaped from. That's my words. They didn't write it. Alison Peter Smithson's Team 10 Primer is the doctrine of their work and theories. They were interested in, the un in notions of unpredictability, circumstance, probability. They were interested in the notion of the temporary and the ephemeral versus the permanent. Secondly, they were interested in flow, in the, the, uh, the idea that <coughs> movement systems, particularly those that create interaction and connection, are fundamental to their work. And thirdly, <coughs> they tried to argue for a kind of social reality <coughs> which involved the complexity of occasion as it occurred in most urban situations at that time. They invented words like most architects do. Socioplastics is the invention. Uh, socioplastics is that word which embraces what uh, painters like Richard Hamilton and Eduardo Paolozzi were trying to do in their painting. Um, it's interesting how few architects of the modern movement or the postmodern movement have had much association with painting. Frank Gehry and uh, is perhaps the only one, Stephen Hall to some extent, connect their interpretation of architecture in light of certain ideas about painting. Um, Whereas the modernists were very much uh, in the mood of all the were painting revolutions which occurred largely in Paris and in Europe. Um, so we have 
the notion of change, the notion of flow, and the notion of socioplastics are central to Team 10's work. We will look a little bit at Team 10's work, but I haven't got the time in this class to deliberate fully on Team 10 and the architecture and urbanistic work. Um, we have to accept that you cannot predict the future. Uh, there's a book by Paul o Ormerod, an Englishman, called Why Most Things Fail, which sets out that we may intend to, give, to achieve a particular outcome, but the complexity of the world, even in apparently simple situations, appears to be so great that it's not within our power to ordain the future. He gives the example of the world's largest, the world's lar 100 largest companies in the period from 1912 to 1995. Out of the 100 largest industrial companies in 1912, how many have survived in 1995? Guess. Well, 48% of the companies which were in the world's largest hundred, world's largest hundred disappeared. 52% survived. So that means over 80 years you have a 50% chance of survival. That's more than human beings. Yeah, pretty good. It's pretty good. He refers to the difference between risk and uncertainty. Uh, risk being uh, where the options are within a span of certainty, such as flipping a coin. And uncertainty is where the options are very unclear, such as a man or a couple of men from the moon landing on the earth, which some people believe in. Uh, the difference between risk and uncertainty isn't easily discussed in the work of the people that I'm going to be arguing for. Uh, there's a notion somehow that in the... Do, do, how much do you know of this work? Who knows about the Free University in Berlin? One person. You're all very ignorant, if I might say so. We don't teach history properly. We don't teach urban history at all. I've complained about this for most of my career, and seeing this is the last time I have to complain. <laughs> I've, I've complained finally, <laughs> for, for the record. All right, we'll talk about the Free University in Berlin project by Shadrach Woods. Um, let's just list, if we can, some of the conventional methods of achieving flexibility in cities. Number one, land banking. You can endow land with cheap uses, farming, parking lots, and so on, on the grounds that in future, when land becomes more scarce, they will be able to be reused without much demolition. Farming is not an option which has been used in urbanism very much, if at all. Farming in New York is on terraces in high 100, 100 feet above the ground, or 1,000 feet above the ground. Um, secondly, easements. Easements are rights of way which uh, can be endowed with 
limited use, such as on the sides of highways. When we spoke about Robert Moses, I spoke about the lack of his provision of easements on his freeways. The cost of providing the easements would have been, uh, would have allowed the, uh, the addition of public transportation on these, next to these roads at a cost which is now estimated to be a fraction of what it now would cost to do that. So, you allow the possibility of an event taking place on land which is easily available and costs very little initially, but increases in value as time passes. The problem with prediction is that there's a difference between the right prediction and excessive prediction. No, not, it's between too little, predi too little response and too much response. Prediction costs money. Under most circumstances. So you have to, you can also do excessive prediction. I think I showed you a diagram of a South African mining town, a classic case where the town was designed so that the central businesses could expand. The expansion area around the center of the city was so poorly treated, so badly landscaped, and not landscaped at all, it was just dirt. It in fact caused the central business area not only to grow, but to decline in size, instead of to expand. Ex leaving land for expansion is one of the ideas that we look at a bit more carefully. <coughs> you can leave open space for consumption assuming a coarse grain in your town. I will show you the example of the Seoul, Seoul Olympics in 1988, which built its Olympic Games on the basis of an, an, a fairly large open space system. Who knows the 1988 Olympic Games? Were you there? None of the games, but I know the site. You know the site, yeah. Yeah. It's a classic example of the cannibalization of easy access space. Open space is easy access, it's cheap. Not cheap in the public's mind, but cheap in the, cheap in the promoter's mind. And most of the facilities, including the Olympic Village by Q Sang Wu, who lives here in Cambridge, was built on this available land. We'll come to Seoul 88 later on. I'm just running through some of these. There's infra infrastructure fre flexibility. Um, when we designed the MIT Brain and Cognitive Sciences Building, we had to allow for the CSX Railroad to run underneath the building. That meant uh, an extraordinary difference in the kind of building which we could design. But we calculated that if the air rights, MIT owns the air rights over the CSX Railroad, about 22 feet or 15 meters, I'm not sure which, I think it's 22 feet. MIT can build 22 feet above the plane of the railroad. We calculated when working on this that if MIT exercised this option and built on the air, maximum uh, air rights, that this, uh, well, uh, they, they have the air rights, the degree to which they can build vertically will be, have to be sanctioned by the city. But we calculated that if MIT wished to expand its campus vertically over the air rights or with the, uh, the, uh, the development would be worth billions of dollars 
in Cambridge terms of square footage. So imagine the possibility of a future in which MIT could build above a railway line. The fact is that we only built to the height that Cambridge allows in our building, which was large enough for our program. But this friction caused by a movement system. Corbusier's proposition of building under the freeways in Algiers is not feasible anymore. The noise and pollution caused by the automobiles would make it impossible to, virtually impossible to build under freeways. One of the dramatic futures in the next few 50 years is going to be to how to capture the space under elevated freeways all over the world. The elevated con to, to a considerable height because you have to be able to pass through with a truck which means that you have to have ramps which at 1 in 10 or 1 in 5 depending on how steep you are, you can take up a large amount of space. So, I haven't seen a proposition in recent times anywhere in the world for capturing the space under a freeway in a, in a positive sense. We have one SM Marquez student project thesis, which you'll see in three weeks' time which tries to do this in Boston with great difficulty. But the air rights uh, mean that a plane, that the development above a plane, which for the moment is used by a railroad or a freeway, and the development below that plane, even in, uh, penetrating into the ground, are options which utopianists have e examined and wondered about. Uh, so we have to include them on our list. Lastly is the question of geometry. And most of my, the rest of my talk is going to deal with, the, with people who've used the idea of geometry to allow for future change. Okay, one of the people who argued for the impact of geometry is Maria Zeferredo's thesis. Maria was in this class and became interested in the idea of change. She wanted to study a city when, and how, make some speculation about how urban transportation transformation took place. She decided after being forced to limit her thesis <coughs> to take MIT. MIT, Shadrach Woods, the architect of the firm, just its forget the name of the French firm. It was an American architect who you developed the word ground scraper as a model of MIT and used as the basis for the design of his free university campus in Berlin. Maria worked in the with the drawings in the MIT archives, which had never been looked at before and made an assessment of the number of geometric configurations that allowed the campus to grow in the way that it did. I haven't got time to go into this detail as, as always. <laughs> Why are we so short of time? Is it because we try to do too much? But if you don't do too much, who says what is enough? Should one take one
project like this and spend a semester studying it in detail. Would you gain more from doing that versus attending a class which tries to cover everything in the world? <laughs> you know, you, you made your choice. <laughs> Among our findings, six stand out. The existence of an underlying circulation system. MIT is, has a block size of 65 feet in width and a central corridor most of the time. The three kinds of stems used. Number three, the quality of the knuckles whenever building change directions. Almost always when there's an, uh, an opportunity to change direction, the vertical circulation system of elevators and, uh, and staircases are contained in the knuckle. So she shows that every time a building changes direction, it is free of having to replace the circulation, vertical circulation system. It means that the circulation system becomes more intense as it is joined to other systems. The fully equipped unit section from the bouquet system, the courtyards as future free space, I never realized that MIT intended the courtyard system as an opportunity for building expansion. Thank God they haven't. Um, the facades. Where facades were considered to be permanent, they were built of granite or limestone. Where the facades were considered to be te temporary, they were built of brick, yellow brick facades. So she argues very systematically with a lot of data that there was a kind of DNA in the system, not a very profound DNA, but a very simple DNA, which allowed MIT to grow until 2004 on its own land. Our building, the Brain and Cognitive Center, is on the other side of Vassar Street. It was the first time a, a building, not of the first time, but one of the first times a major building was built outside of the limited campus. We proposed a connection, an aerial connection from building whatever it is across Vassar Street to a to a place on our second, the second floor of the Brandon Cognitive Center. MIT wouldn't build it. We tried very hard to get it built. In fact, the German engineer, George Schleich, who worked on the Freedom Tower in New York, is probably the best structural engineer in the world, designed the connector, but MIT didn't. MIT now faces an expansion of possibility which is not as simple as expanding on your own land. It has to deal with urban infrastructure of a much more complex nature. Another use of geometry, which we mentioned before, is in the Llewellyn Davis plan for Milton Keynes in London, one of the Mark III new towns. You'll remember that the grid is used, and the grid is spaced at one kilometer by one kilometer, not one mile by one mile. So that the consequence of the generation of volume within this enclosed grid space would not be too large 
and require great separated inter interaction. Some other ideas. The whole premise of Milton Keynes's plan is summarized as follows. The central aim of the plan is to arrange these necessary fixed elements, transport, drainage, water supply in a new city so as to allow the greatest possible scope for freedom and change. They've, it has been planned as far as possible to allow wide varieties in patterns of life and the greatest possible choice for the future. There are two things in the geometry of the, well, in the application of the geometry. Number one is the idea of, as I drew, drew on the blackboard, of recognizing the possibility of a space frame system. A space frame system in architecture is a system which spans distance and allows you to put points on the low, load system at any point, as opposed to a point and beam system, where you can only load the system where there is a column beneath you or your point. So it's a kind of pointless system or freedom of pointing which allows almost any kind of change to exist. The notion of deciding what the maximum amount that you can allow before the system cripples itself is interesting. You have to use mathematical prediction systems like the Poisson distribution. Who knows what the Poisson distribution is? You should know. If you're going to design a university campus, how do you decide, or a schoolroom, how do you decide on the size of the distribution of the sizes of classrooms? You are architects. You're in advanced standing at MIT. You're doing doctorates. You're doing all kinds of advanced degrees. And if I ask you the simple proposition that if you had to walk out of here and you, had to, and you were in Burma somewhere and they were decided to build a new university, how would you decide on its program without knowing the Poisson distribution? The University of Math the Department of Mathematics at Cambridge University, a new building, is designed on the basis of the Poisson distribution. It allocates probability of sizes given certain average rates. I'm not trying to be clever. I'm just trying to say that there are statistical measures which give one a better prediction about the future. One of the best subjects I ever studied in graduate school was statistics. I hated it. But it made me aware of the fact that you can generate knowledge through sampling systems of great capacity. I was staggered when my professor said, the only reason we have live matches is because we know statistically how many matches fail and we can predict the production of boxes of matches without any of them failing or 99% succeeding. Staggered. Staggering, but a simple observation. The Poisson distribution is one of the features of a... So this, the second feature of Milton Keynes in trying to project the possibility of, first of all, diversity and secondly of change is to introduce zoning systems based on performance dimensions. The reason why German zoning started out was because of the industrial city causing noise and dirt and fumes and traffic as opposed to the quiet notions that are required in a residential area. If today uh, a high-tech company 
produces no noise, no smoke, no sound, can it not be adjacent to a residential building? Of course, I don't know how this has worked in Wilton Keynes. If I buy a piece of land and I make a wonderful garden next to it, it has value. If the city decides to build a factory next to it, I lose value. How do you account for that change? Do you repay me? I take you to court and say I have rights. They say you don't have rights to predict, to confiscate the rights of, a, of development uh, so around you. It's a fundamental problem if you wish to design for diversity. You can of course write rules saying that a factory will not be within 100 feet. But performance dimensions measure sound, noise, frequency of traffic. If trucks start working as they do in New York at 5 o'clock in the morning and I want to sleep, what right do I have to stop the trucks from offloading at 5 o'clock in the morning? These are tough questions and flexibility simply runs up against some of these questions in a very real sense. It would be interesting to check. I need to talk to John de Moncho, who is one of the designers of Milton Keynes, about how this has been handled. To Re Rodrigo Perez de Arque, who argues in favor of keeping existing stock and building an architecture of addition, he says urbanistically it has three advantages. By being a gradual organist, organized incorporation of parts into an existing core, it implies the use of a pre-existing structure. And by doing so, it extends the likelihood of this being in use for a prolonged time. Secondly, it allows for a form of development characterized by its low cost in both social and material terms. I'm not sure that he's right. Maybe it's true in Colombia that the cost of renewing buildings, such as the buildings around here, which have been renewed for high technology purposes, is extensive. It's not automatic that you put a, that if you extend a building, you put a, all you do is put a bedroom. Uh, in addition to a house. And thirdly, he says that this process, this transfer, additive transformation, ensures a sense of continuity in the construction of the town and a sense of place in both historical and spatial terms. He goes on and on. This is the piece from uh, Architectural Design. If you can't find the AA little book. Let's look, and I need you to look at the, your transcript. Let's look at the development of a systematic campus plan, starting in, in, in The British were very intelligent after the, they won the war, the 3945 war. They decided under the Labour government, which replaced <coughs> Churchill. Churchill was interestingly successful as a war leader, but hopeless as a, as a, as a peace leader. Maggie Thatcher was equally hopeless. She was a big war success with the Falkland Islands. Big victory indeed. Yeah. Anyway, we start with 
1961 plan for the University of Sussex. This is post-war, post-45, rebuilding of education institutions in Europe. And I use this data just to make an argument about the change. 61 Sussex is a campus plan. There are separate schools, the individual categories, individual enterprises, School of Mathematics, School of Humanities, and so on. By the University of Lancaster in 1964, attention starts being paid to the connecting of places. And the system is one in which Modular space is connected in a, so in a complex network. Number four, the University of East Anglia in 1961. The plan is now a solid linear configuration with three with small outgrowths, but the whole system is very much based on a linearity of number five, the University of Essex in 1961 tries to take that linearity and bend it up and down. By now, people are asking questions of whether interdisciplinary knowledge systems are not taking hold. Biology and science, or physics and chemistry. So the breakdown of conventional disciplines suggests a kind of grouping of and even a future in which this might continue, allowing for a switch to the next page, the University of Surrey, where you start getting some inclination of the idea of building modular space of various dimensions. The University of Dublin, Giancarlo de Carlo's project, starts trying to articulate the linearity by having a central public spine, much like the main corridor at MIT, and outgrowths from it, depending on the need to be close to the public versus our versus space which requires research privacy. We go on to the University of Loughborough in 1965, which is a major, major departure. Now a 50 by 50 cube by 15 feet high is the only element to be designed in the, in the university space. It will account for 70% of the campus. What does this imply? It implies that we maximize the possibility of change. Every space is endowed with a service structure so that my office can become a uh, a space for a research scientist who needs specialized heating, specialized air, specialized steam, specialized power. If I produce all of this for everybody, we can change with maximum flexibility. Do you understand the idea? This is the ultimate measure of flexibility. A unif uh, 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 an item which has infinite flexibility. In the competition for the university, new university of Bremen, one of the competitors had a railway line right through the middle of the campus with a train, uh, with a crane on it. And it kept on moving the parts, modules, all over the place. So that if, I, if my department grew, some modules could be added to the top of my existing department. 
if, uh, if we fired half of the Department of Architecture, the modules could be replaced. If you speed that up, you can imagine coming to your office on Monday and needing an algorithm to explain where you should be or where you're going to be. MIT Central Corridor, despite the changes, has remained. In a, it has a low rate of change. It should have changed much more than it has, but it's become embedded into the system so that whilst almost every other space at MIT has undergone change, it hasn't. It has the same old dull administrative Instead of building a cafeteria across the street, MIT should have jettisoned its administrative facilities and used this major corridor as a place for real public, for exhibitions, for eating, for people coming together. It didn't. It lacked the intelligence or the but so excessive flexibility is very costly. One of the reasons you can't do advanced science in the old part of MIT is because the, is the lack of the infrastructure is too weak. The sixth floor of our building, our building has six floors. Well, I'm the sixth floor is for animals. All of animals are generally in basements. One of the future for building university research facilities given climate change. In New York, you know, New York University, the animal laboratories in the basements, wall flooded. All the research was lost. We put ours up in the sky for no clear reasons. We thought the animals would be better off up in the air than down in the basement. And nobody disagreed. On top of that floor is a floor of machines. Machines which look like airplane systems because the building needs to be is a, is a laboratory which has to give, uh, account for research which requires highly specialized vectors of steam, light, all kinds of elements which the ceiling panel, the ceiling depth of about 18 inches or two feet in places is so dense that you cannot get another pipe through there. If we had been, uh, count, if MIT would have allowed us to account for future flexibility, we would have made the depth greater than the 18 inches or two. It costs money. We weren't allowed to plan the building with any space on the building called TBA to be added. We had to, it's like packing an aircraft carrier. An aircraft carrier probably can change internally, but anyway, let's move on with this, these diagrams. Got a few minutes left. The Pottery Sink Belt of 1966 was Cedric Price, the British architect's attempt to do a couple of things. To eliminate the idea of a campus from having only having separateness from the rest of urbanism. He decided to reuse the, to place this British university in an area of suffering economic decline in Staffordshire. He argued that this embedding of the university into the society's needs 
would spontaneously produce a, another kind of university, such as it would pro it would stimulate the economy, for instance, through a la promoting a landlady industry, and so on. Instead of building university dormitories, I showed you a project in. New York by the Ford Foundation, which attempted to do the same thing, that instead of building university dormitories, create a market for the supply of housing by the poor people around the university. The last of these plans is the most famous of them. It's the Free University in Berlin. Shadrach Woodrow writes about this plan. We have not we have not begun by trying to give fixed points within the system. I know they will have this. People make the identical features, not the architect. I do not want to make any symbols to begin with. I think that the use of the building creates centers of activity. <coughs> the plan is really an attempt not to make center and so on to begin with. It's interesting that the implication is that if you give a, a an opportunity for people to arrange themselves, they will have the capacity to do so in a correct manner, or in a manner that is correct for them. This is a time when Chom Noam Chomsky was, was lecturing about the innate ability of a child to construct a specific system of interconnection amongst concepts and conditions of use and reference on the basis of scatter, scanty and scattered evidence. Is there DNA in human beings which automatically will be able to create better space than a specialist guiding them? Or what combination of the two? Classical anarchism Well, as I can only judge from from Shadrach Woods, who was a very good architect, um, this is absolutely anti-classical. The crowd will organize itself as it goes along and works and studies. There will be a generation of space which will be more the result of the participation of the people then imposed on them. I'm putting it rather crudely. The notion that there is a DNA in all human beings, according to Chomsky, which allows a child to com construct complex sentences without having been told how to do it, admittedly with the parents and society around them to guide them, but Chomsky is fairly well established as an authority now. There's still controversies around whether the DNA of people have this capacity without much learning. My own position about the Free University is a bad, has had a bad history. It's been vandalized, it's been destroyed, it's had to be rebuilt. Uh, it never fulfilled the promise that Woods had for it. So what we see through, look through all of these cases from Sussex in 61, where the armature of separate items in a campus are dismantled into a system which is almost cybernetic in a sense. 
free associations of networks created a freely over time, suggesting new relationships. The trouble with architecture is that it's not easy. You just can't take a piece of paper and stick it on a wall. The wall has to have bearing. Acoustics, unfortunately, means that the only way to separate sound is with mass. So the university is the last place in the world to flitter around with stud walls or metal, prefabricated metal panels. If we had a prefabricated metal panel uninsulated, we wouldn't be able to teach in this class. So again, the Poisson distribution might say, might guide one into knowing the frequency of places which need acoustic separation versus those that don't. In the same way that the Loughborough possibility of making everything possible, a Poisson distribution would say that the likelihood of wet laboratories occurring in your campus are this, and therefore you should only spend the money on a feasible uh, solution which requires 70% of your buildings to have this flexibility. The Stata building has no wet laboratories in it. It has, therefore, it has nothing out. I mean, if you knew architecture well enough, you could look at the Stata building and our building and compare them fundamentally and say, the one has wet laboratories, the one doesn't have any by looking at the, uh, the amount of chimneys on the roof. We have every <coughs> kind of chimney po emanating smoke or oh, gas, whatever comes from MIT. Uh, the Stata building has nothing. It has a flat ceiling roof. It's about the only flat plane in the building. Okay. I want to look briefly at two other cases. The one is the, by the way, there's a piece by William Fawcett in the MIT Planning Journal of one or two volumes ago on flexible life, flexibility. It's called Invest in Investment in Flexibility, the Life Cycle Options the Synthesis. He talks about, he gives examples of prediction which is based on estimates of outcome and the costing of the estimates of outcome and the decision which is based on the system. I'd also recommend that you read something in Kevin Lynch's book, What Time Is This Place, for an attempt to, in the space-time continuum, to play around with the idea of time. There's a page in which he goes through a whole number of possibilities of changing time. And it's he doesn't speculate about his implications on space. I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff and end with the last two because we won't have time. I'll deal with this mainly through the slides. I can't find the right place. The two cases are The use of temporary environments of a fairly large scale in cities. The one is the story of Paris between 1855 and 1900. After the success of the Crystal Palace exhibition in 1851 in London, the French built an exhibition in 1855. And almost every 11 years afterwards, 1855, 1867, 1878, 1889, 
in 1900, it had an exhibition, a temporary exhibition, a major temporary exhibition in the center of Paris, just north of the Seine and largely south of the Seine. I, I'll go through some of the material with the slides, but let me read you a quote from the French. novelist Jean Giraudoux about the existence of a temporary city as opposed in conjunction with a permanent city. He's talking about the citizens of Paris. They are delighted by the thought of reaching this cardboard or plaster city through the permanent stone site of Paris. What an extraordinary idea. that part of your city is rotating at a faster speed than the other parts. The Free University of Berlin has no stone site. It only has transparency. Maybe you need a balance between stone site and cardboard. And he goes on. They do not come to see a disguised and transvestized Paris. This is not a, the exhibitions are not transvestized Paris, not changed Paris, but they are unique, they are on their own. They come attracted by the temporary union of an ephemeral city with the millenniary one. The association of the most eccentric city with the most real and tangible one. It's an extraordinary idea that you keep the center of your city to change at a more rapid rate. In, I'll show you slides of 1867 being the first structure and the demolition. That takes place within a period of 11 years. So every child in the city is seeing construction and destruction until 1900. So of course, the most significant event takes place in 1889 and considered a, trans, considered a temporary phenomenon. The Eiffel Tower is the most permanent of all phenomena in Paris. So, again, out of this temporary sea of change, there are a couple of items which remain and log into a system of permanence. Although the Eiffel Tower was regarded as an American structure, easily taken apart and assembled, a fabricated structure, unlike the solid neoclassical form of a Parisian facade. The Trocadero, which was on the other side of the Seine in the 1878, uh, the 1889 exhibition, was demolished, although it was had a, a plaster facade and looked as if it had been there forever. So these juxtapositions are interesting in themselves. The last and the most permanent of temporary phenomena are the Olympic Games. In 1896, the Olympic Games was, uh, an ex was an attempt to recapitulate one of Greeks on Greece's ongoing traditions that is the ancient site of Olympia, 776 BC, which consisted of two components, a permanent religious component with priests dealing with flames, and the outdoor comp series of components, gymnasia, stadia, palestra, uh, health, spa, and so on, dealing with a a cultural attribute of the body 
being performed in competition every four years. In 1896, Baron de Coubertin decided to make some mileage out of re re reclaiming this idea. 1900, it, the Olympic Games were held in Paris at the time of the 1900 exposition. There was no, the Olympic Games was nothing. It was a joke. The exposition was everything. The swimmers swim in the, uh, had their races in the Seine. The discus throwers had to throw their discus in the Bois de Boulogne in amongst the trees. But it was a signal event because you do two, you do two vectors. The growth of the exposition movement from 1855 to 1900 and then the decline of the exhibition movement and then the, the advent of the Olympic Games transplacing the exhibitions. The 19, the games didn't succeed. 1904, it came to the United States in St. Louis. Maybe you don't realize that the United States has had the games four times. Where? New York has never had the games. Los Angeles had it twice in 32 and 84. Uh, that, that's the Winter Olympic. I'm talking about the Summer okay. Games. Lake Placid was Lake the Winter Placid. Game, where American hockey team beat the Russians yeah. and caused enormous xenophobia <coughs> in this country. Um, the Olympic Games really only took off in '32 in Los Angeles, the modern games that is. It's one of the his, one of the remarkable. Events. It was during the Depression years. The United, only the French were allowed to drink alcohol. Oh, it was remarkable. It made a it made a million dollars profit, despite the fact that there not many people could afford to come. <coughs> Thirty six was the acme of Hitler's performance in Berlin. Well, Lenny Riefenstahl's film at the 1988 uh, Games in Seoul, I, I was asked to do a presentation and I showed the introduction to Lenny Riefenstahl's film as opposed to the 84 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. Riefenstahl, in case you don't know Lenny Riefenstahl, she was the German, she was the very cryptic and uh, and uh, all over the place German uh, filmmaker who made Olympia. She convinced Goebbels and Hitler to record. They were very proud of the fact that Hollywood couldn't make a film of the 32 games. They, I'll show you some of the first still photographs from the 32 games. But Hitler said, we are going to make a film and uh, I could go into some detail about the film, but you can still find Olympia in the 7-Eleven, not 7-Eleven, what, 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 what are the local, sophisticated local video outlets here in Cambridge? I don't know. It's all on your computer now. Yeah. Well, if you can find it, Michael, if you can find it on your computer, find it. Um, let's look at these images. I'm sorry, I have to show. Uh, I've written about the Olympic Games. It's in the reading for today. Uh, I went to. I've been to two Olympic Games. This is the last meeting of CIM and the arguments at Waterloo between the closed aesthetic of BBPR's building in. Milan and Giancarlo's building in Matera in the south of Italy. I haven't got time to go into. Next. 
some of the projects of Team 10. This is Alison and Peter Smithson's project for the Golden Lane competition. You'll see the drawing indicates an enormous attempt to create maximized communication. Almost every level has people on it doing something or other. Here is a building which takes linear form and people are supposed to con to socially condensed, to use the Russian term. Uh, it's absolute nonsense. I lived in, when I came to America, I lived in Underton Memorial Drive. It's a skip-stop elevator building, which means that you have three times the volume going into the elevator. I picked up a newspaper every morning, uh, quite early in the morning, outside the front of my door. I never in 10 years ever saw another person in the corridor. <laughs> Next. Park Hill Sheffield, one of the outgrowths of this system. It's now being rehabilitated and changed. You can see again, the whole idea of the pedestrian sidewalk, which is a sidewalk elevated in space, is that people will use it to, there are just too few people in a building of this kind, in most residential buildings, to generate enough, as if communicating with everybody who lives next to you is a good idea. I mean, it's, 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 a strange, it's a strange notion in our thinking about urbanism that we're all Greeks meeting in the Agra to discuss our local politics. Uh, they all kinds, we'll come back to this in talking about the contemporary American city. But there's a mistaken notion, I think sometimes argued by Richard Sennett mistakenly, that uh, density of population provides intercourse between people in a very spontaneous way. Yes, you can only get married to somebody you meet. <laughs> and pity. Next. Another notion by Candelis, Josich and Shadrach Woods' firm, the town of the extension of Toulouse, Toulouse-le-Marais, the notion of the web. A web again is an architect geometric form which is meant to produce important intersections. Next. Perez Darke, this is in your handout. This is the story of Shand re-urbanizing re Shandigar. You start off by building a few things. Over time, these get added to and added to and added to and added to. And the plan of the central part of Corbusier's changes over time as the growth is, uh, is consistent all along. So you start with very, as I think Louis Kahn said, you, I'd like to build the town in, when he was working in Dhaka, uh, first out of mud and bricks, and in the end that it will become a city of gold, <coughs> something like that. Next. Perez Darke's pro, the ultimate goal would be to exhaust the center of Chandigarh by new construction additions. That's the secretariat building in the distance. And in the case of Louis Kahn's central complex in Dhaka, 
Darke says that you can, through a selective additive transformation, you can change the city and build on existing systems rather than create something from scratch every time in a finished way. Next. The MIT campus, which you all know well, that's a diagram from Maria's thesis. The project for the new University of Borkum in Germany by Candide Scherer, Josset and Woods, it has no elevations on the outskirts. They are just points of growth and expansion. They stop expanding where the topography curtails expansion. There's a central line through the system, but the old idea is that this is a space-time configuration that can change at a speed which is not yet determined. Next. The University of Zurich competition. The university is a set of spaces colored in red and blue with different rates of change. Forget about the one on the right. That's the University of Pavia by Giancarlo de Carlo. Next. Lafbra, the 50 foot by 50 foot module, fully serviced. Next. The French. Paris story in the Olympic Games. This is the, the white space, is the transformed white space of the center of Paris uh, from 1855 to 1900. On the right are the various uh, exposition artifacts on the middle at the top is the first 1855 pavilions on the Champs-Élysées. 1900 they are rebuilt as they are today and linked to a system across the Seine on the south. 1867 on the left is the perfect round the world form. 1868 it crosses the Seine and the, it builds the Empagadero on the, on the left bank. No, it's on the right bank in French. Uh, and so on, we get the advent of the Eiffel Tower, yeah, 1889. You have the contrast between the, the apparent temporariness of this building and the apparent permanence of this. 1937, this one goes, but the Eiffel Tower stays. Next. Eighteen fifty-five of the two buildings just west of the blue uh, the Champs Elysees, the co continuing year, the Champs Elysees, and the two replacement buildings for the 1900 exposition. Uh, I can't reach with my hand. Next. The 1867, 1878. Next. 1867. The, you, over 11 years, you see this cycle every time in the construction of something which is ephemeral. And then it is, this is 1867 being removed. Next. Delaunay's painting. Of the, this painting has a number of features about the existential condition of the Gare, of the Eiffel Tower, as a symbol in the city. And here is an example of a neoclassical system which has much meaning 
apparent meaning embedded in it, but is easily removable as opposed to that. You can contrast the meaning of these two items in the urban system. Why is the Eiffel Tower still there? It produces more income than any other public feature in, in Paris. <laughs> Paris is the largest tourist city in the world. It spends more money per capita on cleaning the city than any other city in the world. Silly comments. Next. And the final resolution in 1937 with the two winners are the Russian pavilion and the German pavilion. Our friend Melnikov's design for the 37 exposition was never built. Next. The plan of the original Olympic Games, the inner core of the Temple of Zeus and Hera, and outside the palestra, the wrestling, the gymnasium, the bathhouses, the guest house, the hippodrome and the stadium. So the, the plan for the Olympic Games in Munich in 19, when was Munich? 72? I think 72. 68 was Mexico City. I used to know the dates all, but I'm sorry. Next. 1896 in Athens, 1900 in Paris, next, 1904 in the United States, which is part of an international, much like Paris in 1900, 1904 was part of an international festival. Yeah, Bushman from South Africa produced to dance. Bushman started running in the marathon, were chased off the course by dogs and didn't finish. <laughs> the whole system was the, the museum, the museum of, the great, wonderful Museum of St. Louis, the Art Museum of St. Louis, is still based on the site of the original exposition in 1904. Next. 1932. This is one of the wonderful set of still photographs taken of the games in 32. Next. Interesting. Here we have for the first time the reuse of a stadium. On the left is the Vice President of the United States in person, Mr. Garner. I think his name was Garner, at opening the exhibition. In 1984, security is so tight that the President Ronald Reagan appears only electronically. But the building remains the same. One of the extraordinary things, well, we'll see it in the next slide, next. But then in 36, the flame from the connection to original Aryan Greece and arriving in Berlin with Hitler on the stadium podium, next. Sorry, I think that's the wrong slide on the left. The slide that's supposed to be on the left shows the network of the Los Angeles 84, 32 and 84 stadium. Transportation-wise, it has worked remarkably well because it allows distribution of traffic in every 360 direction, 360 degree directions. Um, this is Speer's project for Hitler for 400,000 people, which would eliminate the Olympic Games configuration and hardly be able to anybody to see. Next. 
some of the plans. This is Seoul. Most of these stadia are built on the few on the on parkland. The wonderful Olympic village by Kyu Sang Woo at the top. Next. I just have cut out most of the other slides. This is <coughs> two aspects of the American, a uh, uh, couple of aspects of the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games are temporary events in cities. They've been used for cities like Tokyo to argue for building a freeway system or building new housing. They've been, been used by countries like contemporary China, Tokyo in 1960, Melbourne in 56, to introduce the city as an in as a international, the important place for trade, for psychological satisfaction, and so on. Los Angeles and the American Exposition Olympic Games at Atlanta, at Atlanta and Los Angeles have argued that you can use, reuse existing infrastructure, that you can capitalize on the existing resources in the, already in the city. The 84 Games builds no new housing. The Olympic Village is based on campus housing in in the University of Southern California. The only building, the only new facility built in 84 is the swimming pool paid for by McDonald's. So there's not only a notion of the private sector playing a role, which the IOC, which is a semi-fascist organization, corrupt as hell, uh, controlling the franchise. The Los Angeles Games is widespread, distributed over according to the plan of the town. The games in, uh, in Barcelona are also very tightly associated with the major form of the city, the Ensange. Next. Just the Olympic 1928 on the right, the American team was is housed in a boat, the ultimate ephemeral item. This is Cape Town. I was going to talk about Cape Town's attempt to use racial integration as a social basis for the plan of the Olympic Games. They never got, they never entered next. And the, the project for the Olympic Games in Boston, reusing the river and the university facilities along the river as the core. And here's an indication of how much the games cost and the division between the private and public sector.